A very warm hello to everyone, wherever in the world you may be. Hopefully you're all doing well and keeping safe. This will be an exciting session as we have distinguished guests with us. Um, but before we start, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Angelica Camacho. I am an ADB JSP alumna. I recently graduated from the University of Tokyo with a Master of Engineering in the field of Urban Engineering, and I am honored to be your host today. Uh, thank you for joining us despite your busy schedules, and we hope you will learn a lot from this event. Now, please allow me to start the program by greeting our renowned speakers, distinguished guests, ADBJSB scholars and alumni from across the region. On behalf of the ADBJSB Secretariat, I welcome you to the ADB Japan Scholarship Program Symposium titled Knowledge for Development. Once again, we are embarking on another challenging year full of changes in our own countries, in our region, and in the world. But we gather here today to share knowledge and how to address some of these challenges and move towards a brighter future. To formally welcome the participants to today's program, let me introduce Mr. Takahiro Yasui. Mr. Yasui is ADB's Executive Director for Japan. Prior to joining the bank, he was Deputy Vice Minister for International Tax Policy of the Japan Ministry of Finance from July 2018 to July 2020, and was responsible for the policies on international taxation in the ministry. Mr. Yasui, please. Thank you very much, Angelica. I hope you can hear me, okay? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thanks a lot. ADB Managing Director General and Officer in Charge, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Wu chong -un, Dean Tetsunobe, Distinguished Guests, alumni, Scholars, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are today. On behalf of the Government of Japan, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second ADB Japan Scholarship Program Symposium which is organized as a session during the Japan Funds Week, commemorating two decades of Japan Fund for Poverty Reduction. The fund was recently renamed as Japan Fund for Prosperous and Resilient Asia and the Pacific, but the abbreviation remains the same, JFPR. It was the same month of June last year that ADB JSP held the first symposium with the same digital transformation in tertiary education in the post-pandemic age. We learned what are the challenges and opportunities presented by digital transformation, how universities and digital companies capitalized on the use of digital technology, and how scholars adapted to all these changes. This started ADBJSP Knowledge Sharing Initiative which is one of the several important and innovative enhancements made in 2021 to address changes, changing demands for education and the skills development in, in the Asia and the Pacific region. The annual symposium is designed to create a platform where the ADB, JSP exchange ideas and disseminate knowledge in collaboration among scholars the nearly 4,000 alumni, many of whom occupy key positions in their respective countries, and also partner institutions and ADB. Moreover, by inviting experts to speak, we have the opportunity to learn the state of art as we jointly look for solutions to development issues and challenges facing us. That is what we want, J ADBJSP scholars to have as takeaway from the symposium and their academic discourse. Not only those knowledge and learnings from research work and knowledge sharing events, but also how to translate them into the actual projects or initiatives that will contribute to their home country's development agenda and the region as well. Another ADBJSP initiative is to support scholars and the partner institutions to focus on research, research topics more relevant to the need of ADB's development member countries. Following the one ADB approach, the ADBJSP works closely 
with ADB Institute and ADB's knowledge and operations departments in identifying knowledge gaps and helping guide, uh, helping guide scholars' themes towards their topics. I understand that eventually support will extend to the CCS advising and reviews. By the third quarter of this year, award will be presented to, to scholars in recognition of their outstanding research in selected sectors under the second CCS of the Year Award, or TOYA. Winners will have the opportunity to present their thesis in the TOYA workshop and have them released as ADB publications or working papers. Through these ADB JSP initiatives and by ensuring close linkage of scholars' academic background and professional experience to their proposed field of study, it is our hope that the scholars can be partner in their development work in their home countries in the future. The theme of today's symposium is knowledge for development. It is very fitting as JFPR began a new chapter with its focus on prosperity and resilience. On behalf of the government of Japan, I thank our eminent speakers whose, whose knowledge contribution will be essential to the success of JFPR and ADB JSP. JSP. I also wish to ex express my sincere appreciation to the organizers and to all the participants. I very much looking forward to a fruitful and insightful discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Yasui. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Wu Chong Um. Mr. Um is ADB's Manage Managing Director General and Officer in Charge, Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. He has played various roles within ADB over the last 28 years. Please help me welcome Mr. Um. Dean Tatsushi Sonobe, esteemed speakers, partners in the designated institutions, scholars, alumni, ADB colleagues, guests, ladies and gentlemen, this knowledge event is an integral part of the 20th anniversary celebration of the JFPR, one of the Japan Trust Funds that we administer in ADB. When JFPR was first established to mitigate the impact of the Asian financial crisis on the poor, it stood for the Japan Fund for Poverty Reduction. Since then, ADB has received over $1 billion in contributions to JFPR, which has supported over 500 grant and technical assistance projects in 36 developing member countries. In 2021, the government of Japan, seeing how the COVID-19 pandemic had pushed back to poverty over 80 million people in Asia alone, called on JFPR to focus on resilience and sustainability measures. This is when JFPR was renamed to the Japan Fund for Prosperous and Resilient Asia and the Pacific. So as we look back and celebrate, JFPR's two decades of poverty reduction work we also celebrate the birth of the new JFPR. We thank the government of Japan for its support to JFPR, as well as to ADB Japan Scholarship Program, which has received $200 million in contributions since its establishment in 1988. President Masa's vision is for ADB to be the trusted partner of the region and the preferred choice of its clients and partners. He emphasized that we must develop our explicit and tacit knowledge to help solve emerging issues with our clients while disseminating our practical and cutting-edge knowledge within and beyond Asia and the Pacific. ADB JSP has been an important pillar in building capacities within the region, graduating almost 4,000 scholars since its establishment in 1988. In 2021, the new ADB JSP implementing guidelines added knowledge sharing as an objective of ADB JSP to leverage scholars' academic work and the program's partnership with academic institutions and alumni to further strengthen ADB's work with DMC. We are pleased that ADB JSP has evolved to become an active partner in ADB's knowledge program. I've seen the excellent research that ADB JSP scholars have produced and what the Secretary has done to make them widely known. The Thesis of the Year Award has been a clever way to sift through scholars' work, one of which has been published 
through joint efforts of ADB JSP and ADB Institute. This symposium, Knowledge Towards a Prosperous and Resilient Asia and the Pacific, comes after last year's inaugural symposium on digital transformation in tertiary education in the post-pandemic age. Today's theme is equally relevant and will strengthen synergy between ADB JSP's knowledge work and ADB's operations. Through our external speakers and discussions with our partners in the academe, our scholars and alumni, we hope to learn new knowledge that would render more effective ADB's work. We also look forward to seeing ADB colleagues share with guests their knowledge from operations. We in ADB recognize that we cannot work as a silo. We need fresh ideas from outside. Cross-fertilization is sometimes the best formula for producing the most hardy, resilient crops and the best and most tasty fruits. Such is the case too in the realm of knowledge and ideas. I congratulate the Japan Funds team of our Partner Funds Division for putting together this symposium and this interesting week-long event. I also want to thank our speakers and all the participants in today's session. And I look forward to an interesting exchange and harvest of fresh new ideas this afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Ohm, for your inspirational message. Uh, before we continue with our program, may we please invite everyone to turn on their cameras. Uh, let's take this opportunity to capture our group photos with our VIP guests, alumni, and scholars. So, all right, so everyone, big smiles, and let's hold our smiles as we go through the Zoom pages to capture all the participants. It might take a few moments, so just keep flashing those smiles. Thank you, Angelica. We're done taking the photos. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your patience as we took snapshots of everyone present at this historic occasion. Uh, moving on, we will now have a session on knowledge and development. Our moderator will be Mr. Tetsushi Sunobe, Dean of the ADB Institute. He served for six years as the Vice President of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, in Tokyo and taught economics for 30 years at the Tokyo Metropolitan University and GRIPS. Dean Sunabe is a recipient of the Nikkei Book Publication Prize and the Masayoshi Ohira Memorial Prize and a founding board member of the Japanese Association for Development Economics. Dean Sunabe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, thank you, E.D. Yasui and uh, uh, MDG Uchon Um for excellent heartfelt uh, welcome remarks and the keynote speech. It's an honor to moderate this symposium. Taking part in ADB JSP events uh, is always a great pleasure. I got to interact, I get to interact uh, with uh, young scholars, alumni, and colleagues from the academe. The topics we are discussing today are all important and as mentioned by EDRC, crucial to helping developing member countries achieve resilience. I'm very happy to virtually meet uh, eminent speakers. We are very lucky to hear from four speakers who are leaders in their respective fields, regionally and globally. Uh, we will have two sub-sessions. The first sub-session is on health and environmental risk. We will hear uh, Ms. Kuki Sujakmo on climate change and the disaster risk management, and Dr. Inbu Bushan on universal health coverage. They will each speak for up to 15 minutes, and then the talks will be followed by up to 15 minutes of combined Q&A. Uh, for the two topics. The second subsession will feature Dr. Amar Patacharaya, uh, who will speak on quality infrastructure investment. And followed, uh, <coughs> and sorry, Mr. Alexander uh, Cabrera, 
who will discuss public finance management. Again, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. During the short intermission between the two subsessions, ADB JSP will present a short video on knowledge for development. Dear ADB colleagues, uh, colleagues from the academy, ADB JSP scholars and alumni and friends, please welcome our eminent speakers and feel free to engage them uh, during the Q&A. You may type your questions in the chat box and our uh, uh, MC will read uh, the question one by one. So now let me introduce uh, Ms. Mukti uh, Kuki Su Jackmon. Kuki is the executive director and uh, co founder of Indonesia Research Institute for Decarbonization. She's been uh, working on climate change since the early 1990s through Climate Action Network. Kuki assisted Indonesia president, uh, special envoy in international climate negotiation, including during the preparation of the Paris Agreement. She is currently the lead co-chair of Think 20's Task Force 3 on governing climate target, energy transition, and environmental protection. Kuki, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dean Sonobe, and uh, good afternoon, everyone from Jakarta. So without, I think, without uh, further ado, I will just start my sharing my presentation. I don't have many uh, slides, but, oh, sorry, I need to share it first. Uh, but I think, uh, what I hope is that we can have like more discussion later uh, based on uh, the limited or, you know, like limited presentation or slides that I share here. So uh, as already uh, mentioned earlier, my uh, basically my session will be on climate change and disaster risk management. And I think this is one of the area that is important if we are talking about earlier uh, mentioned also about this um, uh, prosperous and inclusive resilient uh, Asia Pacific. So since we are here uh, in the ADB uh, session, it will be talking about Asia, but also Pacific. And we know that, that uh, all those area are quite uh, vulnerable to the impact of climate change, as well as to the environmental uh, uh, pollution and issues as well. So uh, we know that our activity basically as a human uh, activities, including our development process have resulted in greenhouse gases emissions. And uh, this uh, then led to climate change as we know, you know, the whole process from emission all the way to the climate change. And this is something that we need to uh, address as well. If we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, knowledge for development, then we need to understand what is it that we can do uh, to address the issues of greenhouse gases emissions. We need to do uh, mitigation, for example. We need to absorb the emission or the concentration or the carbon that are in the atmosphere, uh, as well as reducing the potential emission of the greenhouse gases. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we know that climate change is already happening. It's here now, and I think all of us already felt the impact. Uh, the impacts are uh, diverse from one area to another. Uh, and also, you know, like the impacts itself, like have a different, uh, how do you call it? Uh, the level of it will be different. It's not only because of the the, uh, the 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 climate change itself, but it's also because how we, as the one that will receive the impact, uh, how how strong we are, how uh, resilient we are to the impact itself. So uh, 
And we know that in fact, all this impact is uh, to some extent uh, may lead to disaster. We've heard about it and, and some are already happening. Uh, sometimes people not directly link it to climate, but there are definitely uh, issues, uh, especially the hydro meteorological impact or disaster basically have will be very closely related to climate uh, and it's part of the climate impact as well or the climate change impact for for example we are talking about drought it happening in many places in asia uh, and maybe not much in the pacific part but it's basically in in the continent uh, we are talking about flood. It's happening in many places, not only in the, uh, you know, suburb, but uh, and rural area, but a lot happening also in the cities. We also see what happened with the sea level. The sea level rise a big issue is a big issue for us in Asia and and Pacific, and I think this is really a big issue for those, especially in the. Small, uh, small island states uh, in the Pacific, and we need to to really take care and and you know basically uh, address this issue. These are uh, the the table that I got from one of the ADB uh, publication, and I think this is exactly what we need to do uh, if we want to uh, address the issue of climate change, and we want also at the same time address the issue of uh how do you call it uh if you want to address also the disaster that happening so if you see on the left hand side here because this this book is basically or this publication is basically addressing the three issues so climate change uh building climate and disaster resilience but also enhancing sustain environmental sustainability uh, it's it's the whole package, right? Basically, we have to deal with the tree, and there are a number of of uh, activities or how do you call it? Maybe approaches that we can do. For example, uh, because when we address uh, climate change, building resiliences as well as enhancing environmental sustainability, then we will be able to have like a prosperous. A community as well, and and for this, then one of the issue will be, for for example, green business and jobs, so that the current or the if I can say the business as usual business and jobs are not, uh, how do you, are not fit any longer with our situation. So we have to shift it to the green one. For example, if you are talking about energy, we need to shift from the fossil based uh, energy to a cleaner one to a, a renewable one and this is also will happening for uh, urban system so urban development including the transport system it has to be sustainable if we can have a sustainable transport and urban development then we will have like clean air uh, water and we also be able to manage our waste uh, but also we need to deal with uh, the, if we are talking about the food uh, supply chain, right, we have to start from the beginning, from the upstream, which is the agriculture and the sustainable land use. Uh, and at the other hand, if we are talking about the, the impact again, uh, then we need to, to deal with the infrastructure, how to have like the right infrastructure so that we can still face the any disaster that coming, especially disaster that related to climate change. And also definitely we need to have a better uh, environmental governance. So there are, a, you, as you can see, a number of, uh, in the subpillars, you can see different intervention that can be done uh, to address this issue. Because I don't have much time, so I'll just uh, uh, go ahead with the next one, if I can. Yeah, and this is uh, again from the same publication. So you can see here uh, that basically you have a different uh, pillar as already uh, shown uh, in the earlier uh, 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 figure. And you can see that there are a number of activities and 
we cannot just do the whole things without what what is here in the blue at the bottom so basically finance technology capacity building knowledge and all those things a policy framework regulation and so on are important so that all these things can be can be done as well so i mentioned earlier about the climate that already happening and the impact right and how to address the impact usually we will do uh, adaptation but with uh, the if i can say the unsuccessful mitigation effort that we have been doing so far uh, then adaptation is not enough and right now we already have this issue of loss and damage so loss and damage is basically you know the impact of climate change that already cause loss and damage and this cannot be uh how do you call it uh, recovered so we need to deal with this and for addressing the loss and damage then we need to maybe develop new approaches or maybe maybe we can still build on the existing one but we need to consider much broader impact much broader risk also uh, and this is uh, definitely to ensure that the community that the people will be living uh, in a more better uh, situation and in a, a more prosperous way but this is i think one of the biggest issue and i think uh, it will be a good uh, issue also for especially for all the the participants here, uh, be it the scholars, uh, as well as the uh, alumni, that uh, addressing loss and damage is still very difficult at the moment, because I think the, the issue is uh, we still have a lack of understanding of what is it and how to deal with it so that we can really address it in, a, in, a, in the right uh, system. Uh, we can make a decision in the right on the right way and also we can support uh, the, the decision and its implementation through including different means of implementation and, and including financing so i'll just stop there uh, and i hope we can have more uh, discussion later uh, during the q a thank you dean sonobe thank you very much cookie Yes, uh, thank you very much for dealing with the huge issue uh, in such a short time. Uh, now, let's move on to uh, the next uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Imbu Bushan, uh, senior associate at Johns Hopkins University. Until recently, Indu was chief executive officer of Ayashiman Bara uh, Pradhan uh, Mantrijan uh, Arogya Yojana, difficult to uh, pronounce for me, uh, the flagship health assurance scheme of the govern government of India, uh, covering more than 500 million students. He had previously worked for the World Bank and ADB, where he, his last assignment was uh, Director General of the Strategy and Policy Department. Thank you very much, Indu. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sonobe, and thank you very much, JSF, for inviting me. Uh, as uh, Dean Sonobe mentioned, I used to be with ADB. I lived in Manila for more than 21 years, worked with ADB for 21 years. So my soul lives in Manila, whereas I live in New Delhi. So I thank you again for uniting my soul and my body, uh, although virtually. Uh, so in terms of, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, uh, in my presentation, I've divided this into four parts. I'll first discuss what is universal health coverage and why should we care about it. Then I'll go on to uh, show you how the region has performed on UHC and uh, then what are the lessons learned and finally, I'll close with what can and should ADB do to support UHC. <clears throat> so starting off, what is UHC? So this is the standard definition of universal health coverage 
by uh, WHO. And as you can see, it has three parts. One, that there should be a provision of health care, and that should be a comprehensive provision, not only curative, but we should have promotive, preventive, rehabilitative, palliative, all types of services should be provided. Second issue is that it should be of sufficient quality so that they're effective, not only provision of services, but quality services. And finally, and most important probably is that we should ensure that while people use those services, they should not be exposed to financial hardships. Uh, it can also be shown in a form of a three-dimensional cube where we can see what proportion of population is covered, what kind of services, what proportion of services are covered, and what kind of financial hardship is covered. So for example, uh, Professor Sonobe mentioned uh, I was head of National Health Authority in India, where we established a health insurance scheme, and which was covering about 500 million people. So we were covering about 40% of the population of the country, remaining 20% were being covered by others. So 60% were covered, 20% was still not covered. We were also covering up to 500,000 rupees, which is about $8,000. And uh, so that was the, but uh, in many cases, uh, families had to pay more, so we were not paying 100%. Third was we were covering only inpatient care, not outpatient and many other services. So one has to see that what is the proportion of all this, uh, uh, all these three dimensions the country is covering. And one thing is very important to note that there is no ultimate, we can't say that country has achieved UHC. It's only direction and we can just uh, go towards the direction we will. We have to continue to work on it. There is no ultimate uh, uh, USC that we can't say that one country, uh, even the most developed country in the world, uh, would have achieved universal health coverage in an absolute term. So it's a relative uh, measure. Now, okay. So why why should it matter? And of course, after the COVID crisis, this question is uh, uh, almost uh, redundant because we know that uh, health matters and good health is uh, a key element of quality of life. Without uh, good health, uh, of course, life doesn't have much meaning. And uh, not only it is a good, uh, it's a key element of quality of life, but healthy population is also a prerequisite for a wealthy nation. Uh, unless you have healthy population, uh, uh, na nations, uh, countries can't uh, uh, have a sustainable growth. Uh, third issue is that healthcare expenditure is very regressive. It actually imposes much more uh, pressure on vulnerable and the poor, and therefore there is um, uh, there is a justification for government to be involved and government to be involved in a big way. And finally, unless you have you would see any initiative to fight poverty will be ineffective because it will be something like leaking bucket. You keep filling water in the bucket and it will never be full because, uh, for example, in India, we have this uh, the studies which show that every year about 6 million people fall into poverty because of expenditure on health. So as you, you know, bring people out of poverty, because of health expenditure, people are going to be going back to poverty. So there is a need for supporting EHC to make uh, your health poverty reduction more effective. Now, it's not a surprise that uh, uh, UHC is one of the key SDGs, uh, SDG 3 and SDG 3.8 uh, is specifically for uh, UHC. It has two components. One relates to the coverage of essential services. For UHC, you have to provide services, and that is 3.8.1, that uh, there should be provision of services. And number two, that there should be social protection, that people while using services should not fall into, or should not uh, be subjected to hardship. So that's uh, uh, 3.8.2. <clears throat> so now coming to the second part, how we have done in Asia and Pacific on UHC. Uh, so we, uh, we assess the performance on uh, UHC on two indicators. One is called service coverage index and other one is called catastrophic health spending index. 
So service coverage index is uh, what kind of services, what range of services are being covered in the country. And number two is uh, what kind of catastrophic uh, uh, expenditure is being incurred by population. So let me just... Uh, Show you here. So here, uh, this is the. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, it's uh, it shows uh, where the countries are. So if you're on the right side, that shows that you are uh, your service coverage is very good. And if you're on the upper side, that will show that uh, your uh, financial uh, hardship uh, or the catastrophic uh, in spending is uh, lower. So you would see that Thailand has done extremely well. It's uh, uh, something like what uh, uh, even Australia, uh, like they are matching Australia in terms of both provision of services, but also reducing uh, financial hardships. Uh, many other countries either lack in terms of not providing enough services uh, or uh, not having enough uh, financial protection uh, against those services. Uh, so, so uh, how, how does uh, the country, different countries stack up here? So I have uh, plotted these countries uh, on public exp expenditure, what the government spends as percentage of DG GDP, which is on the x-axis, and out-of-pocket expenditure, OOP, out-of-pocket expenditure on the y-axis. So of course, if the people are paying more out-of-pocket, that means that uh, the coverage is poor. And you would find that one thing that as countries spend more, uh, the out-of-pocket expenditure reduces. And I think that makes sense because a uh, uh, very intuitive uh, thing with uh, governments are paying more, the people are paying less, and uh, that is uh, the thing that we see. So you'll see that on uh, this side, the countries uh, largely in Pacific Islands, and also especially Thailand, which are paying a, a lot for health, health care, and that's why, or because of other reasons also, out-of-pocket expenditure is low. And the countries here where they're paying much less, very little, uh, including unfortunately uh, India. Uh, and that's why uh, also we find that uh, out-of-pocket expenditure is quite high. Uh, and there are other countries in between where uh, they are paying slightly more uh, and out-of-pocket expenditure is a little bit on the lower side. But you'll also find countries which are actually paying a lot more. For example, Maldives, uh, uh, probably uh, there is some issue of uh, maybe uh, maybe efficiencies that in terms of uh, what they're achieving in terms of reducing out-of-pocket expenditure is not uh, commensurate with the amount of money uh, they're spending. Uh, so in summary, we can summarize them uh, like this, that the countries which have low public expenditure and high out-of-pocket expenditure, of course, they need to increase uh, low uh, public expenditure that will uh, lead to, uh, if other things are also in place, uh, lower uh, out-of-pocket expenditure. And this is a gradient that I've shown. Uh, of course, uh, it doesn't go uh, like this uh, always, but this is uh, something uh, that we see. And uh, the countries here like China, Thailand, Bhutan, and many Pacific Island countries who've done very well, uh, Indonesia, Laos, Philippines uh, uh, are also doing well, and other countries can uh, do, do better. Now, coming to the third point, that uh, what are the lessons uh, that we've learned? Uh, so one is that, of course, as I, I showed you, that public financing plays a key role. Without public financing, of course, you can't use, uh, you can't have universal you know, health coverage. Uh, that is uh, essential. Uh, so we have to have a system where compulsory prepayment should be done, uh, that uh, people should be uh, prepay rather than postpay, uh, and uh, but for doing that, it has to be ensured that poor people are fully subsidized because they can't prepay. Uh, and that was the kind of scheme that I was, uh, I had put in place. Uh, uh, these 500 million people that we cover in India, uh, in Ayushman Bharat, uh, are the poorest 40% uh, people in the country, which government fully subsidizes. So this is the kind of things needed. Third thing is that voluntary health insurance uh, plays a relatively marginal role because Voluntary health insurance has many issues, and I can come back to that uh, during the question answer session. And finally, some people think that social health insurance, if we have done social health insurance, that is equal to 
universal health coverage, but that is not correct. And social health insurance typically covers very small uh, part of population. I think we need to go beyond that. Second thing is that not only we have to cover the poor, but also the near poor, because uh, uh, in uh, mo most of our countries in Asia and Pacific, uh, we have a heaping, what we call, there is a large number of people just above the poverty line, and they need just small shock to go into poverty line. So uh, we need to cover not only the poor, but also the near poor, because just one shock, they can get into the poverty uh, line. So we have to cater to them as well. Third is that for having a universal health coverage, uh, it is very important that we have a very strong primary health care because without strong primary health care, uh, I think prevention, as they say, is better than cure. So firstly, we have to have good prevention, but we also we have to have very good linkage of prevention, primary health care with, uh, with the curative uh, uh, health system. Uh, fourth thing is that uh, there has to be risk pooling. Uh, you can't have different uh, uh, schemes. Uh, we have to see that high-risk people who are have a propensity for, say, greater disease, uh, have to uh, subsidize or to be subsidized by low-risk people. Uh, there should be a subsidy from rich to the poor, and there should be a subsidy from uh, elderly, from the young population, productive population to the elderly population. Unless that happens and that kind of social compact happens, uh, UHC is not feasible. And related thing is what we've seen is that uh, when there are fragmented schemes, there are many schemes which are looking at different kinds of pools. There's a scheme for public, uh, uh, public officials, there's a scheme for poor people, there's a scheme for uh, uh, rich people, then it doesn't work because that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, inter the subsidization, cross subsidy in terms of social compact is not there and that uh, doesn't work. So there has to be one scheme uh, which covers everyone uh, for UHC to work properly. Uh, and six issue is that there are many issues with prepayment and pooling because uh, there could be adverse selection. Uh, people uh, who are likely to use services uh, are getting enrolled, so one has to do something about that. There could be cream skimming from, uh, from uh, uh, providers that they want to just uh, address only those diseases that, that, are, uh, that are easy to uh, address or they're more uh, provides more uh, uh, reimbursements. Uh, there's the moral hazard issues, uh, both in terms of supply and demand. Uh, once you are insured, you want to use more services, also from doctors and providers. Uh, once they see a patient, which is an insurance, uh, they will um, try to maximize uh, their, um, their revenue. Also, there's a, a semantic information principal agent problem. So. Uh, in designing the scheme, all these four issues have to be very carefully thought through and checks and balances need to be put in. And finally, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the system and I'll not go through this very complicated slide, but I can come back to it uh, in the interest of time and uh, where a lot of uh, efficiencies can be brought in the system in terms of uh, ensuring that we focus on outpatients, uh, we ensure that we can reduce vaccine preventable and ambulatory care sensitive admissions. Uh, we also have to ensure that we reduce hospital acquired in infections and we ensure that people get out of the hospital soon, but not too soon. And uh, uh, so there are many areas where a lot of efficiencies can be brought in. Finally, what can ADB do? Uh, UHC uh, is such a big field. So first of all, <clears throat> Uh, what I see uh, across uh, our uh, de developing member countries, DMCs, that uh, there are a huge amount of uh, advice needed on policy issues. Uh, who should be covered? What kind of services should be covered? Uh, how should we pay for it? Who should pay for it? Uh, how should we cover the poor people? How should we identify the poor people? How should we link uh, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary healthcare services? Uh, what should be the referral system? Uh, what kind of organization should be set up to uh, provide this kind of support? There are many policy issues. I think uh, many uh, DMCs would, uh, uh, would benefit from uh, uh, advice from ADB in terms of providing options that these are different options on these policy issues. And uh, given this uh, state of uh, uh, state in the country, uh, we recommend that. Second is that of course, capacity to implement those policies 
uh, is missing in many, many uh, countries, then that's where ADB can support. And finally, there's a huge financing gap, both in terms of provision of services and providing, uh, providing financial protection, there ADB can come in. And I believe, uh, because uh, uh, I work with ADB, uh, that ADB instruments and the way ADB works with countries is that uh, they're highly suited for supporting USC. Uh, there is no other organization um, or development agency which is as suited as ADB because of many things, because ADB can work with public sector and private sector both. And actually for USC, uh, because public private sector provides so much of health services and is an essential part of health system, so ADB can work with both and uh, provide a comprehensive whole of society approach. Uh, ADB has some very excellent instruments, uh, results-based lending, policy-based lending, where ADB can support both policy reforms as well as uh, uh, investments and also achievement of results. And uh, so uh, it had, they have the instrument. And ADB has technical assistance uh, facilities, including JFPR, uh, which uh, uh, is an excellent uh, one. And JFPR actually has been assisting uh, health sector right from the beginning uh, uh, for a long time, and uh, uh, both uh, for policy reforms and uh, uh, capacity building, and they can provide that support. And finally, uh, ADB works on regional uh, approach, and uh, there is a a uh, lot of uh, things that can be done uh, in terms of regional uh, approaches. And we have to uh, look at cross learning and sharing of uh, uh, resources uh, that can be done. And uh, here ADB has, uh, uh, is, uh, and I must say that ADB has been working on these areas, uh, including many countries like Vietnam, Thailand, uh, um, Cambodia, Mongolia, uh, Papua New Guinea, and they can, and they have a uh, track record and skill base for doing that. So with that, I'll close and I'll uh, look forward to uh, questions uh, uh, and uh, uh, try to respond to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Indu. Anjika. Uh, yes, we do have questions in our chat box. So first one is for Ms. Siyahmun. Um, does climate change always have a negative impact? So in pre-industrial period, how floods occurred without climate change. So can we say that recent, all recent floods occurs due to climate change? Um, and I guess following that is globally, scientists estimate peatlands are emitting the equivalent of one to two billion tons of carbon dioxide, which is around two to 4% of all human greenhouse gas emissions. Does clean energy, uh, is clean energy enough to subside climate change? And how can we also play a role in reducing carbon emission from peatlands? Uh, <clears throat> okay, thanks, thanks for, for the question. So I think um, if you are talking about the flood, be it uh, the one that we have now or earlier, uh, you know, like uh, in pre-industrial uh, era, for example, then Definitely, uh, it's not only because of climate change. Uh, there is also an issue of infrastructure. Uh, so how we can manage uh, and how do you call it, like channel the, the water, basically. So that, that would be one of the issue. But what happened now is that in some areas, because of the changing of climate, then the, uh, the, the type, the character of the rain, uh, as well as the how do you call it? Uh, so the, the rain now is becoming uh, heavier. Uh, so that uh, in a short time, you will get uh, much more rain uh, in a shorter time. Then this uh, will, uh, you know, like uh, create problem uh, with, the, with the current infrastructure because most of the infrastructure, especially if you are talking about the one for uh, uh, sewage, uh, including uh, how do you call it drainage for for the for the uh, uh, rainwater then usually uh, it will be uh, most of them will be for a certain capacity or a certain intensity of of rain so with the changing uh, character of the rain then that channel may not be able to uh, basically to 
to accommodate all the water. That's why it's up. Uh, the we get more flood. So the flooding itself, it's not only because of climate change, but the climate change makes things uh, worse and more difficult also to tackle. And uh, I think uh, the second questions will be on the uh, role of uh, renewable as well as uh, uh, land base, if I can say, because it's uh, talking about uh, pitland as well. So yeah, basically our effort to uh, reduce the emission, uh, it has to be done in all sectors. Uh, we cannot just rely on uh, energy or renewable energy uh, because renewable energy will help, but it may not, uh, we will still need energy and not all places will be able to have like a, a real renewable. There, there will be some area that to some, because of different situation, then we may still rely on a certain uh, percentage of uh, fossil. So we need to also, as I mentioned earlier, to absorb uh, all the, not all, the greenhouse gases that's already in the atmosphere. Uh, and that where the role of all these uh, greeneries, the land, land use, uh, so it's basically like the coverage uh, of uh, forests, of different uh, greeneries will play a significant role. And if we are talking about peatland, yes, peatland is quite challenging uh, because, uh, but in fact, it's in a way, you know, if I can just simplify it, uh, the issue with the peatland will happen if the pit area is dry. So what, what we can do is basically to keep those area wet uh, so that the methane will be uh, kept in the, in the water, in the, in the soil. Uh, and so what, what can be done there is basically maintaining the level of water uh, in the uh, pitland area. So maybe I'll just stop there. And if there are any other questions later, uh, I'm still here. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question. I think this is also for Ms. Suyahun. Uh, this is uh, from the United Nations University. Um, yeah, investment decisions of any institution should be informed by the impacts of climate change. Does ADB or ADBI conduct programs or projects that enable a democratization of decision useful climate information? I, I'm not sure about this. Uh, I mean, like, because I think the question is for ADB or ADBI, uh, but I think uh, we, you, you know, like we need to have that kind of thing. Uh, we need to involve like not only the government, uh, so it's not like not only top down kind of thing, but it's a basically top down, bottom up, and covering all all players. So I think I I would uh, think that maybe uh, Dean Sonobe or the others uh, will be able to to respond to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, maybe I, I will respond later because of time. So maybe let's move to the question to Indu first. Um, for Dr. Uh, Bhushan, yeah. the, the introduction of UHC in India lower the cost of private care in India. You mentioned that the government is contributing $8,000 per household. Mm -hmm. What would you say has improved in the last three years after introductions and is the allocation sufficient? Uh, first of all, the allocation is sufficient because whatever has been allocated, uh, our scheme has not been able to use it because we were uh, spending only about 60 to 70% of whatever was allocated. So allocation is not a problem. Uh, so for sure, there has been a, a reduction in the uh, out-of-pocket expenditure, uh, but, you know, three years uh, since the scheme was put in place is not a long time. I think we have to uh, wait for some more time to see what real impact it had. So whatever we have seen is only from anecdotal uh, experience and there are no uh, studies uh, which are rigorous enough to uh, show what actually impact has been. But uh, if you look at the indicators in terms of how many treatments have been provided, uh, so uh, so far, 
about 30 million treatments, more than 30 million treatments have been provided. And if you look at the cost that uh, poor people would have incurred on those 30 million treatment uh, would be actually uh, close to about, uh, uh, close to 3 billion, I was told. So in that sense, I think we've reduced the, the cost uh, of uh, that uh, for the poor uh, in last three years, uh, which would have, uh, there was another question which was very, uh, very important that what is the, how much should the governments uh, spend? What is the optimal level? And if you allow me, I'll just uh, go back to uh, my, one of the, my slides, which actually very powerfully shows that, uh, where you can see that, you know, uh, you can spend a lot of money, but uh, after spending about two to 3% here, uh, then uh, the payoff in terms of reducing out of pocket expenditure actually uh, becomes much lower. So uh, once the uh, countries are spending three to 4% of GDP, uh, I think that should be enough. After that, probably one has to focus more on improving efficiencies maybe. Uh, so you can spend a lot of money on very expensive tertiary care, uh, but uh, you not get that kind of uh, returns in terms of uh, uh, reducing financial protection, maybe you will be supporting very small uh, number of people uh, by doing that. So, uh, and I had shown a slide that there are many areas where I think efficiencies can be uh, brought in. Uh, so my, my answer is that three to 4%. Uh, China, of course, is spending already more than 4%. Uh, that question was there. And now the question is in China, how to improve efficiencies uh, in the system uh, in terms of coverage, uh, they are doing very well, but in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, reducing, uh, improving financial protection, uh, I think much more needs to be done. Um, thank you, Dr. Bushan. Uh, Dean Sanabe, do we still have time for another question? We're receiving quite a lot. Okay, so yeah, so then. Uh, ADB, ADBI about the climate change. Yeah, so please look at, for example, the ADB, it's a climate finance uh, website and also, also energy transition mechanism. Uh, you, you will have uh, lots of information. From ADBI side, uh, for example, uh, in last uh, December, we had a big conference on climate change, uh, inviting many uh, excellent speakers. And then. Uh, the books out of that conference will be published very soon, uh, which will be available uh, free of charge uh, or uh, open access book will be uh, published soon. Uh, so, Angelica, please go on uh, for another question, maybe for two, two minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, another one then for Dr. Bushan. In what areas is capacity most needed? What areas would you encourage scholars to pursue? Well, uh, there are a lot of areas in which capacity is needed. Uh, one which I find the capacity is almost non-existent is uh, research and evaluation because you know uh, we implemented the question was uh, had come that uh, what has been the impact of what we're doing um, uh, doing in India. So looking at monitoring uh, the uh, supporting monitoring and uh, uh, looking at what has been the uh, effect of uh, uh, your uh, uh, your interventions is very important, and that's where I think uh, large, uh, uh, huge amount of capacity is needed. So I would actually encourage scholars to, uh, while they are in their academic uh, uh, institutions, is to focus on seeing how uh, the evaluation should be done, uh, which is rigorous, which is uh, uh, different methodologies for evaluation. And because uh, that feedback loop is extremely important for any program, because uh, many times what we think is that this is something that we are doing and we have this faith in ourselves that uh, uh, this is going to work. But actually that is always not uh, the case. Uh, and that feedback loop can come only through a rigorous evaluation method. So of course, there are many other areas where uh, capacity is needed, but that would be one area which I'll uh, point out, which is, uh, I think needed in most countries that I've worked in. Thank you, Dr. Bhushan. Um, thank you, Dean Sanabe, Mr. Jaimun, for that enlightening discussion on health and environmental risk. 
we certainly have a lot to think about as we've received a lot of questions. Um, before we move on to our next session, let's take a moment to watch this video on making knowledge work for development. Welcome to the ADB Japan Scholarship Program. This is ADB a and ADB JSP for recognizing my most ADB JSP scholars who demonstrated excellence. I was the recipient of the ADB Japan Scholarship. Congratulations, ADB JSP. Putting knowledge based investments where they are most needed. ADB Japan Scholarship Program, or ADB JSP, was established in 1988 to provide graduate scholarships to deserving students from ADB developing member countries. It has graduated 3,815 scholars from 29 designated institutions or DIs across Asia and the Pacific. As of 2022, there are 25 DIs, 15 of which are in Japan. By giving scholarships to their nationals, the program hopes to help accelerate economic and social development as the graduates return to their countries to apply their enhanced knowledge and skills. Beginning in 2021, ADB JSP sought to maximize synergies between the program, the partner universities, and ADB. It aims to enhance curriculum learning through symposia, knowledge events, and expert contributions from ADB and the ADB Institute. ADB JSP organized the first Thesis of the Year Award competition to foster academic excellence, recognize outstanding research, and highlight scholars' contributions to knowledge for development. Three theses have been published in journals and a working paper. They also presented the theses in an online workshop. In 2022, ADB JSP expanded the competition to encourage research in rural development and environment, public management, human development and infrastructure. Seven scholars received awards, including for Thesis of the Year Award and a special award for innovation in research and development. On the other hand, the Knowledge Symposium series provides a space to discuss topics like digital transformation and tertiary education in the post-pandemic age. In that symposium, representatives from the government of Japan and senior ADP management addressed the audience composed of alumni, scholars, representatives of partner universities and ADB staff. A university vice president, an alumnus, a current scholar and ADB specialist spoke and shared their insights. Using one ADB approach, the ADB JSP works closely with ADB Institute and ADB's knowledge and operations departments to pinpoint knowledge gaps that scholars could look into. If needed, ADB and ADB Institute specialists can provide advice and mentorship to scholars and alumni. ADB routinely conducts year-round events, fora and symposia. ADB JSP makes these events accessible to partners through announcements and links. Starting 2022, ADB and ADB JSP will pilot formal knowledge partnerships with universities beyond current agreements on scholarships. These may involve knowledge exchange and peer reviews, referral of experts as resource persons, trainers or consultants, or joint research or studies. All these capitalize on the strengths of development specialists and practitioners, as well as experts in the academe. Work with us for a prosperous, resilient, and inclusive Asia and the Pacific. Partner with ADB JSP for Knowledge for Development. Uh, once again, I would like to call on Dean Sanove to lead our next symposium session. Dean Sanove, please. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, now we move uh, uh, the uh, second subsession, uh, which is on uh, public infrastructure and governance. To speak on quality infrastructure is uh, Dr. Amar Patacharya, who is a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings Institution. Dr. Patacharya was director of the group of 24 from 2007 to 2014 an intergovernmental group of developing countries, uh, finance uh, ministers and central bank governors. His prior work was with the World Bank, where his, his last uh, 
position was senior advisor and head of the international policy and the partnership group. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, please uh, give us a uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Sonove. Um, particular pleasure because I've had the uh, pleasure to collaborate with ADBI Institute on the subject that I'm going to talk, and I'm very proud of that long-standing collaboration. Uh, I also want to thank Mr. Kasahara and his team for arranging this. And of course, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to current uh, participants and alumni uh, of the ADB Japan Scholarship Program. So I'm going to share, I have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I'm going to share. So um, uh, just bear with me one second. You should be able to see my screen. Um, and um, I will move to the PowerPoint mode. Just give me one second and we'll be all set. Um, so my presentation is um, on the role and financing of quality infrastructure. Um, it's uh, an issue which really started with the Japanese G7 um, and you know, took uh, traction very much in the G20. Um, and uh, I'll give you both uh, an overview of the substance, but also where we are currently on uh, the um, you know, quality infrastructure agenda. Um, I know that we don't have much time, so I have a, uh, uh, the presentation will be available uh, for everybody. I've tried to put together uh, the presentation as a source of resource material in this area because it is really a very, very extensive field. Um, so I have four parts in my presentation the centrality of quality and sustainable infrastructure for growth, uh, development, and climate, uh, the urgency, uh, scale, and opportunity, especially in the post-COVID context, uh, how do we unlock investment opportunities, and then I'll speak very briefly on the financing of sustainable and quality infrastructure. So quality and sustainable infrastructure is really at the heart of sustainable development and the SDGs, it delivers on inclusive growth, it enhances access uh, to basic services, and it promotes environmental sustainability. Uh, uh, sustainable and quality infrastructure is fundamentally about transformation of key systems, energy, cities, food and land use, water, industry, innovation, and transport. Um, the scale is very large. Uh, of what we are looking at. And there in that scale are also tremendous opportunities. If you look at most of the you know, developing members uh, of, for example, the Asia Pacific region, most of their infrastructure has yet to be built. You know, something like three quarters of say India's infrastructure by 2050 has yet to be built. So there is a tremendous opportunity to build that infrastructure in a much, very different and a better way. And this whole push and quality infrastructure is really pointing the way in how it needs to be done. So I want to next talk, talk about urgency and scale. You know, uh, in the next uh, 15 years, uh, you know, infrastructure investment will double. In the next 20 years, the GDP of de uh, developing countries will double. And in next 40 years, the urban population will double. And we have to do all of that while in some sense meeting the climate goals, which means really achieving net zero by the mid-century mid if we are to adhere to the one and a half degree target. At the moment, uh, we are off track in terms of climate targets and you know, how we build the new infrastructure will be crucial in terms of reaching climate. The difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is extremely significant, especially for, as we are seeing, you know, with the heat waves and the floods that have been ravaging the region, the recent, you know, heat wave in India and Pakistan, extreme heat frequency of rainfall extremes and average drought length, all of those very, very 
significantly different between one and a half and two degrees. So very important as we think about building this new infrastructure, most of which will be in Asia, that we build it better and it be of high quality. The context is very different right now. The world has been in many ways transformed by the COVID pandemic. The collapse in output has been tremendous. And sustainable infrastructure is at the and you know is at the heart of building back better. At the G7 summit day before yesterday, as you saw, the G7 has announced yet a new initiative on global infrastructure, recognizing that building back better, building better infrastructure is at the heart not only of the developing country agenda, but the partnership between the G7 and the developing world. Sustainable infrastructure has very important characteristics that will help us recover strongly and better from the COVID crisis. It will help us deliver on the SDGs and most significantly, it will help realize opportunities for a much better path of growth. So, you know, it is really behind what we call the growth story of the 21st century, one where we are getting cyclical recovery, one where it is driving in some sense productivity and innovation, and low carbon you know, growth is the only feasible growth strategy on offer. A high carbon growth strategy will de deconstruct, and you know, uh, quality of infrastructure, of course, goes well beyond low carbon. It encompasses many other elements. I will come to that shortly. Let me talk now about while infrastructure is very important, you know, we are have perennially been unable to deliver on the quant quality and quantity of investment needed. And this failure is essentially because of two gaps. Most countries are unable to transform the tremendous needs and opportunities for sustainable infrastructure into realized uh, demand. And a significant proportion of investment is not as sustainable as it is. So we really need to, in some sense, connect the opportunities in infrastructure to concrete programs and pipelines of projects. And second, although there are tremendous large pools of savings available, we are not able to actually tap those savings for infrastructure investment. Of all of the long-term institutional savings that we have in the world, less than 3% is devoted to sustainable infrastructure. And as far as emerging markets and developing countries are concerned, that number is close to zero. And part of this is because of the very complex nature of infrastructure investment, but also because at this moment we have an urgent challenge to cut emissions and build resilience. So this framework basically says we need to have the following elements if we are to be able to um, you know, tackle uh, the, the agenda on sustainable infrastructure. We need robust upstream policy and institutional foundations. We need platforms to uh, unlock projects. We need to be ensure that you know, all these projects are aligned with sustainability and quality. And we need to be able to, of course, mobilize the financing on scale. And for all of this, we need shared understandings of what is quality infrastructure? How do we get quality infrastructure? And that's something that the G20 has been very much focused on. I also want to make a point that fundamentally, and this is a very much related to the governance issues that will, the next panelists will be discussing, you know, the complexity of decision-making in the infrastructure space. Infrastructure requires a strong enabling environment it requires a sequence of decisions that have to be made in which the public sector plays a crucial role, but the private sector is increasingly important in undertaking the investment and its implementation. And for that, we need strong institutional foundations and governance. Now, the G20 principles on quality infrastructure 
tried to basically set this out by saying, look, the aim of pursuing quality infrastructure is to maximize the economic, environmental, and social and development impact. And there are six principles that have been set out very much through a very deliberative process in which I participated while, you know, for, uh, when I was in the G20 for also when, in my current capacity. And the discussions have really brought forth a very healthy dialogue between developing countries G7 counterparts, international financial institutions, the number of actors that have been active in the space and ADB and ADBI have been very, very active in this really has made this a very productive discussion. And these principles that I list here, which are built around development impact, economic efficiency over the life cycle, integrating in environmental con uh, considerations, building resilience, uh, against disasters and risks, in integrating social considerations, and very importantly, strengthening infrastructure governance are all seen as an agenda, which is absolutely vital if we are going to not just get the scale right, but the quality right. Uh, this slide, which I won't spend time on, is intended to give you a resource guide to what is a very complex field right now of sustainable infrastructure. These are important pieces. There's a piece that you know, I co-authored, which, which started some of this work. There is the MDB infrastructure cooperation platform around indicators. There is the GRIS indicators that the Asian Development Bank developed. There is case studies done by the Global Infrastructure Hub a lot of OECD work in this. Uh, the World Bank has also established a quality infrastructure portal. Uh, the G20 is in the process of developing a compendium. It is in, you know, it will come out in this cycle of the G20. So if you Google what is there, I'm sure it will sh show up in a matter of uh, weeks. And finally, there is a navigator, which is a very useful tool to you as students and practitioners on all the toolkits and indicators that have been developed in the sustainable and structure space. So in closing, I just want to talk, run, run you very quickly through the financing challenge. So in, when we think about financing, we should distinguish between two aspects. One is how do you fund infrastructure? Infrastructure is very long-term. Revenues surrounding infrastructure is complex, and therefore a very important issue is where is the funding going to come from? But because it is also long-term, you have to finance it. And so we should separate between funding and financing. Um, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, you know, Dean Yoshino, uh, your pr uh, predecessor, as you know, uh, had done, you know, seminal work on spillover effects uh, from infrastructure, recognizing that a lot of the benefits of infrastructure are not tapped by the direct user. And finding ways to tap those spillovers is extremely important to the economic and financial viability of these projects. A lot of experimentation done on this in Japan, some in the Philippines led by the ADB, also in Thailand, extremely important in making infrastructure viable. Uh, the characteristics of infrastructure are, you know, a very drawn out financing. Uh, you need a lot of money even before the project starts, very large upfront investment and uh, requirements with a lot of uncertainties, and then a very, very long payback period. And uh, in order to finance infrastructure at the scale that we need, we really have to find a way to mobilize all pools of finance, domestic and international, public and private. And increasingly the private sector component is going to be extremely important, which means that we have to be able to take care of revenue and other risks. We have to be able to take care of transactions costs, and we have to have you know, proven financing structures that the private sector will consider 
uh, you know, uh, as adequate. Um, the MDBs play a key role in this space, like the Asian Development Bank, in the upstream space of policy and institutional setting, in project preparation, and in financing. There is, over the past uh, two years, a very, very positive development of engagement of private sector coalitions uh, in this space. Uh, you know, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which, you know, was launched with great fanfare at COP26, has committed to mobilizing $1 trillion a year for green investments in emerging markets in developing countries, a truly ambitious goal, but it can only be done in partnership with the MDBs and the public sector. The fast infra has been developing sustainable infrastructure as an asset class, including through a new label and de-risking mechanisms, CFLI, uh, GISD, the Sustainable Markets Initiative, and also voluntary carbon markets, especially in financing energy transitions, which we have discussed earlier, all of this will be very important. We also need to ensure that finance is aligned with sustainability. This started with the you know, task force on disclosure of climate related risk, but has now moved into the space of sustainable finance. There's a very vigorous work program in the G20 you know, on under sustainable finance to push the boundaries of this. Uh, and you know, it's based around disclosure and reporting around regulatory uh, frameworks and moving from green more broadly to sustainable finance. Uh, let me stop there. I, I don't want to take more time. I'd be happy to come back uh, and questions. So thank you very much. And I should start, uh, stop. Thank, uh, thank, you, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Amar. Okay. And then uh, uh, I move on to the next presentation. So our final speaker today is Mr. Alexander Cabrera. Alex is Chairman Emeritus of PricewaterhouseCoopers Philippines, where he served as Chairman and Senior Partner for eight years. He is also a Governor of the Management Association of the Philippines, uh, both a certified public accountant and a lawyer. Alex leads uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers Philippines Environment, Sustainability and Governance uh, uh, practice and uh, continues to be a tax partner. He's a managing partner and the co-founder of the law firm Cabrera and Company, a member firm of the Pricewaterhouse Coopers uh, Network. Alex, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dean Sanovisan. Um, good afternoon to my fellow uh, speakers, or eminent speakers this afternoon, and uh, uh, ADB scholars and uh, ADB uh, people. Um, let me just get to my uh, presentation. Now, when you talk about um, Sustainable development goals, I think one of the uh, best things uh, happening uh, nowadays is that um, the private sector is quite involved. Uh, ESG practices um, has been a main topic in, uh, in boardrooms. And there's even um, more serious practices around shared prosperity initiatives uh, from the private sector. Uh, but this afternoon we are um, going to discuss uh, not the private sector initiatives, uh, but, but more of the uh, public sector side. And I'll say that you cannot discuss uh, governance um, and transparency uh, without really managing the, the tax side of it, because tax is the uh, lifeblood of government uh, service. And without uh, proper governance in taxation, um, there will be no poverty reduction, no equal opportunity, and the gap between the rich and the poor uh, will, will, never be, uh, will never be bridged. Let me just uh, take up with you. You know, whenever we talk about government, we, 
always talk about uh, tax leakages and um, and corruption, uh, for instance. You know, but there are I, I would say corruption even in the uh, private sector uh, practices, but that's quote unquote corruption because uh, G20 and the OECD uh, would are kind enough to call it harmful uh, practices. And one of the harmful practices uh, involve base erosion and uh, profit uh, shifting. So our uh, ADB scholars, you know, just just to give you some context, you know, tax is territorial in nature. So if you have a, a country that uh, has a high rate of uh, income tax, what multinationals would uh, would want to do, uh, at least uh, some of them, uh, would, what what they would do is to migrate their profits into another country, regardless of whether uh, in that country there are actual operations or there's real flesh in the company set up there. And that is why uh, you will see uh, payments for technical management services, um, royalties, and uh, even, um, even uh, interest uh, on loans and on infrastructure projects, there's the offshore component and the onshore component. And this is now under uh, close uh, scrutiny on whether it involves base ero erosion and invalid profit shifting. And they have actually identified the uh, action plans uh, to address uh, debts. And in this, uh, in this enumeration, you will see that um, a, a common, uh, common theme that uh, comes up is in so far as transfer pricing is concerned. Because whenever there's a base erosion or profit shifting, it involves most likely um, a contract between related parties. And the key between uh, on contracts between related parties is that they should be conducted at arm's length. And pricing, transfer pricing uh, uh, rules require um, that in order for you to uh, in order for that transaction to be arm's length, um, that they should be based on a transfer pricing study, like um, um, it, it requires benchmarking on what other um, unrelated companies are earning. It requires a functional analysis on whether you deserve the income um, that is left, for instance, in a, in a country. Do you have real people here? Uh, do you do you have uh, perform important functions like for instance take the case of uh, BPOs, which is uh, quite common in in, uh, in many jurisdictions because they want to leverage uh, on this uh, so-called uh, excellence uh, uh, centers or uh, outsourced services. Um, in a functional analysis, we will try to determine you know whether the function involves brain power which would be entitled to more a higher rate of uh, fees versus mechanical work, which will be should be entitled to lower rate of uh, margins. Um, the, uh, the BEPS um, requires a three-tier documentation. And this is actually very, very tough because the uh, if you will start with the local file uh, that tells you the industry profile and and uh, you know what people are making in that industry. Um, you go to the master file, which is the global um, scenario, which is uh, basically showing all the uh, industries in the different countries. But the country by country report is the toughest one because it will require you to disclose the entire income and how much income is reported in the uh, uh, foreign country and how much income is reported in the local country. And um, you will see in this draft that uh, while the um, uh, other countries have adopted the three-tier documentation, uh, countries such as Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, and the Philippines have not really uh, adopted the, the three-tier documentation, making transparency really difficult um, in these countries. Uh, this is an example of a harmful tax regime, uh, considered a harmful tax regime, which was in, uh, already eliminated in our new tax legislation. Uh, the incentives to ROHQs because 
Previously, multinationals will set up a regional headquarters here, rendering services to affiliates uh, within the region or globally, and they will get incentives, lower income tax rate and uh, very uh, low fixed um, individual uh, tax rates as well. But that has been removed and the Philippines is now cleared uh, from, from the international list of harmful tax regimes. Uh, this is my uh, main topic uh, on uh, on infrastructure. Um, and, and you will see this is actually a common, uh, probably common scenario where government revenue taxes um, is, is less than government uh, expenditure. And of course, a lot of that government expenditure goes to uh, infrastructure. Um, the actual infrastructure spending um, in the Philippines um, increased because the, the trust of the last uh, administration is build, 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 which is uh, concentrate on infrastructure. And despite the, uh, the pandemic uh, that slowed down the infrastructure, you will see that it made a comeback uh, on all that pent up demand or pent up projects in 2021. Uh, despite that increase, the Philippines still needs to catch up with its neighbors with Indonesia, Vietnam, and, and Malaysia still have uh, larger spending on infrastructure based on their uh, GDP. Now, I, I wanted the students to understand this uh, because I'm going to discuss ODA and, uh, and TPP. And before I, I go to these uh, figures very quickly, I want you to understand something. Uh, like in the Philippines, what the government did in the uh, Duterte administration was go for ODA as a funding mechanism for its infrastructure projects, um, ODA and new taxes. That's why the Philippines went into uh, tax reform uh, and the ODA, which is uh, basically a loan um, um, extended to the Philippines, is still going to be, while they are very favorable loans, if they're not aids and largely they are loans, they're still going to be paid. And if they're paid, they're going to come from taxes. And the thing uh, about taxes is that everybody suffers uh, versus, for instance, a PPP scheme. Because if, it, if, the, if, it's, if it's the private sector that uh, owns the project and it recovers, for instance, the cost of that investment from the public, only the public that is actually making use of that service will pay. Um, prime example, toll. If you don't pass by that road, you don't, the toll doesn't get collected. If you pass by that road, they collect toll on you. In other words, under the PPP program, um, uh, commonly implemented to a build operate uh, transfer scheme, the private in, in that program, it is actually specific taxation that happens. So if you are able to mobilize private um, private funds, and then you don't need to concentrate too much on the collection of taxes to fund infrastructure projects. Um, so that's generic taxation under ODA versus specific taxation in PPP. And um, most of these uh, build, build, build projects during the uh, uh, previous years have been uh, funded by ODA, as you can see in this graph. And uh, ODA, ODA, I mean, in so far as ODA is concerned, the Philippines remains to be, uh, you know, among the top recipients of ODA, as you can also see from this graph, the, among the top recipients in the Southeast Asian uh, region. Now, ODA is not only for infrastructure, um, but really infrastructure takes a lion's share of the uh, ODA portfolio. I, I began to talk about uh, PPP earlier, and PPP is not actually um, exclusive or uh, found only in the Philippines. Um, other, other territories, other economies also uh, use this but it is not really playing a major part in funding uh, uh, infrastructure projects uh, in this region, as you can see from, uh, from this graph. 
but the Philippines uh, is considered ahead of the pack in terms of uh, robustness of its PPP framework. Uh, prior to this um, outgoing administration, the Duterte administration, uh, under the uh, uh, Pinoy uh, administration, um, the PPP is a, has a robust uh, framework and is uh, quite used. Um, and we like the PPP because there's so much governance and the transparency in the uh, uh, project generation, the awarding process, implementation, and uh, and the payment. And that kind of governance and transparency is not present under the <clears throat> under the older scheme. Now, under the uh, uh, Marcos, the new Marcos Jr. administration. They wanted to go back to uh, PPP, but unfortunately, uh, what's happening now is the reverse, because the main issue of foreign investors, in so far as uh, PPP is concerned, is the sanctity of the contract, the no changing of the rules in the middle of the game. Um, what happens is the uh, new regulations; um, it's even more restrictive than the old regulations. So. If you have a contract with the government, you you wanted uh, you wanted there some protection on material adverse effects of government actions. For instance, they they changed the the regulations that uh, prevents you from uh, performing your contract. For for example, uh, I'm going to speak very generally because uh, it involves uh, an actual project. For example, there's an airport project involving a. Uh, Japanese um, uh, uh, contractor um, or developer. And then there, there was a new um, uh, de Department of Transportation uh, uh, secretary that stopped the project and said the terms is not uh, to the best interest of the Filipino people. You know, that that is an example of a project that could have been protected by MAGA provisions or material adverse uh, government action uh, provisions in the uh, in the contract, and that is very important in order for uh, investors in infrastructure to have confidence. Um, and there's there's a need uh, for PPP contracts to have that stipulation. There's a need for government to provide for these uh, contingent liabilities, and there must be actual spending on these contingent liabilities whenever needed, because what's the use of these provisions in the contract if the government really uh, still doesn't pay. And of course, as I said, the sanctity of the uh, contracts must be uh, respected. I will uh, stop there due to uh, limited time. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Alex. So now we'd like to open up the floor uh, for uh, questions and uh, suggestion comments. So Angelica, please uh, moderate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cabrera and Mr. Bhattacharya for your presentation. Uh, we have a question here for Mr. Bhattacharya. Uh, we have scholars here in the civil engineering and urban planning fields. So how can they contribute to quality infrastructure investment? So the um, civil engineers have the most important role to play. Um, we often think of, uh, you know, policy makers, economists and the like, but ultimately, you know, getting an infrastructure project right is really uh, the business of building. You know, we often say we must uh, choose the right projects and we must build the project right. And civil engineers are the ones who actually have to think about it. And sometimes actually the answer is not even building, but maybe, you know, you relying on our natural infrastructure. Um, I uh, urge you to take a look at a new uh, sustainable infrastructure standard that is being developed by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is like a code of conduct for civil engineers. And if you look through that material, you will see very much that you know, how in some sense the engineering profession has a role to play in building a better infrastructure that you know, is really will deliver on the kind of goals that the previous panelist was talking about. 
Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya. We have another one for you. Um, Ms. Nadi Akhtiarasi is very interested in the presentation and talking about economy and financing of infrastructure. Um, how important is it to invest and develop the quality infrastructure in rural areas compared to urban areas, especially for developing countries? And in that, in that same context, what is the ideal percentage of investment between the urban infrastructure and the rural infrastructure? Well, you know, um, you know, by definition, most of the infrastructure will be urban, and indeed, urbanization is a major force for the development of infrastructure through agglomeration. And there are scale economies of doing that, obviously, in terms of connectivity, transport, you know, energy systems, uh, and and the like. But if you want inclusion then you have to be able to also provide you know, infrastructure services in rural areas. Sometimes these economies are more difficult, so countries have to make special effort. And I think the experience of China is really striking because China, more than any other country, has actually built out its infrastructure in rural areas. You know, I've been visiting China since the early 80s, and you know, when you look at the infrastructure now in rural areas today compared to what it was, it's a complete transformation. And it has helped ensure that, you know, in some sense, development is broad-based and also that you know, we, uh, we mitigate against huge pressures uh, for migration from rural areas. India will face very much kind of a similar pressures and one way to do that is to ensure that we are building better rural infrastructure, not just focusing on the urban areas. Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya. And we have a question for, actually I have a question for Mr. Cabrera. Um, is public finance, uh, inf uh, public finance infrastructure, when countries um, develop these, do they look just within themselves, or do they look at other countries as well, or in relation, or working with other countries? Well, certainly uh, governments uh, learn from uh, the practice of um, um, other governments. Um, and um, I would say that um, it's very important to not only uh, learn of the practice, but also adapt uh, that practice. For instance, uh, if you're talking about uh, transparency in infrastructure, there's an open contracting system, um, which uh, I, I saw in the uh, uh, Honduras that uh, uh, decreased the uh, corruption, they said, by uh, by 90%. And what it is is that it's, it's open contracting where um, everything is accessible to the public from the bidding to the qualification of, uh, of the bidder to the award of the project to the implementation until payment. Now, if that if only that is adopted, for instance, uh, in emerging economies, um, you know, uh, for instance, uh, in, in the Philippines, if that is adopted, it, it will result to a lot of uh, confidence, um, a lot of governance, and uh, really minimize the uh, leakage in uh, taxation, even improve the quality of infrastructure, uh, because everything is disclosed in open contracting. Um, and another one for Mr. Carrera. Of all the things that you've, you've said that were critical in the next two decades, which ones are actually the most important? Well, I, I would say that uh, really, um, generically, it's governance and transparency is the most critical because you can come up with the, with the right uh, plans, you know, but, uh, and the money can come in. But if there's no governance, transparency, and accountability, over these funds and the execution of these projects, then there will be no trust. So in order to really succeed um, in, in the next decade, we really need not only to build infrastructure, but to build trust. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carrera. Dean Sonave, would you have anything to add? No, because uh, I have a uh, closing uh, remarks. So. <laughs> okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone seemed really engaged in this conversation. So please look forward to other 
um, symposiums and sessions. And thank you very much to AB, ADVI and JFPR. Um, we will forward your questions to the panelists. So uh, please, we will, uh, for them to address the answers, for the, them to address the questions. Mm. So thank you, Dean Sanabe, Mr. Bhattacharya and Mr. Cabrera for that insightful discussion on public infrastructure and governance. Um, we've had a very interesting set of talks and topics that can help us contribute to uh, the prosperity of our countries and how to navigate challenges in health and environment and manage public finance and investments in quality infrastructure. Uh, I now turn you over to Dean Sanabe for a summary of our discussions today. Yeah, thank you very much, Angelica. And thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Dr. Amar and uh, Alex, uh, also the uh, Kuki and uh, 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 my friend, uh, uh, Sorry, in the <coughs> yeah. So le let me uh, wrap up uh, the discussion. So human activities have led uh, to the increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which in turn led to climate change. So the many natural disasters are likely to be associated with this increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation, including building uh, disaster resilience and uh, enhancing environmental sustainability, all these things uh, lead to uh, prosperity. But uh, we should not do business as usual. So we need innovations in finance, technology, uh, development, capacity building, partnership, institutional development, and the improvement of policies and uh, strengthening the governance. Uh, so we have to expedite all these efforts. And then human activities have also led to the progress in uh, medical science and uh, uh, public uh, health care. So, universal uh, health coverage uh, emerged because of the kind of the passion to you know share this uh, fruit of this development and also the increasing demand for such services and then the uh, lots of uh, new things are happening in uh, developing countries uh, we have seen overall the great progress in this direction, but there have been uh, more, uh, you know, kind of gap between the demand and supply. And the universal health coverage is not just a, a matter of the adapting the kind of laws and policies about, uh, you know, provision or access to health insurance, but uh, really the you know capacity of uh, delivering uh, good healthcare services uh, which requires uh, not only the uh, infrastructure but also the human capability so uh, capacity buildings and uh, those things are also needed so again uh, finance and then um, many supports uh, uh, needed so it's uh, also a huge uh, and a very important uh, policy area. Now, uh, moving to the quality infrastructure, because of the need to making the, you know, societies, uh, uh, communities uh, more resilient against uh, natural disasters. So we need the quality infrastructure. Uh, also, in order to mitigate the climate change, and also create a more circular economy, we need uh, quality infrastructures. Uh, again, we need uh, lots of uh, financing, uh, not necessarily the public, but also private, and then probably the uh, ESG investment will uh, play a very important role. And then uh, because of that need, the public finance management becomes very uh, uh, even more uh, important. And then here, uh, lots of uh, improvement is uh, happening, like uh, uh, Alex uh, 
introduced, we have seen the you know kind of success in combat against uh, BEPS, uh, base erosion and profit shifting, uh, which is uh, International Tax Corporation, or another name is Global Minimum Corporate Tax. So that's now existing, so it's a great uh, progress. Also, the many developing uh, countries are making uh, lots of effort to improve the uh, domestic resource mobilization. Uh, and also uh, trying to uh, have more kind of uh, devices, nice devices to uh, invite uh, private sector investment. Again, ESG investment will play an important role. So all these things are uh, uh, big issues and they require uh, more, uh, more and more uh, you know, effective solutions. And then uh, for that end, so I think the ADB has been doing very well. Uh, in my judgment as a researcher, uh, yeah, ADB is uh, performing wonderfully in, in terms of innovative finance on the use of the those new uh, scientific and the engineering knowledge, uh, kind of application of those knowledge into the policies and then technical assistance, capacity building, and the strengthening the uh, governance. So in all these important areas, uh, ADB is okay. doing very well. And then uh, I hope uh, ADBI is also do a good job uh, in terms of uh, say uh, you know, assisting that kind of uh, activities of ADB as a think tank. And then I hope that uh, our young scholars and alumni uh, who are in this room will join uh, this effort to saving the planet and also making the world a better place. So this is my message. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Sonove. This has indeed been a great, a great learning opportunity for scholars and us alumni and all the other participants in this symposium. I'm sure this will be very useful in whatever spheres we choose to be active in. Well, it certainly has been a very productive afternoon to formally close the program. May we please call on Mr. Jakob Sorensen to say a few words. Uh, Mr. Sorensen is the director of the Partner Funds Division of ADB Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department and the administrator of the ADB Japan Scholarship Program. Mr. Sorensen, please. Thank you so much, Angelica, and uh, well done on your Danish pronunciation of my name. Not many people get that one right. Um, this symposium, I think, has been extremely enriching and thought promoting. I'm, I've really been impressed. So let me extend a very special thank you to our esteemed speakers. You have really, uh, I think, shared a lot of your experiences and knowledge with us. And it has been, I think, for me, very educational and very productive, as you said, uh, Angelica. Thank you also to Dean Sonobe uh, for moderating. And thank you uh, to our participants from our designated institutions, as well as the many ADP colleagues uh, who have joined in. Thank you also to your scholars and alum, uh, alumni, and thank you also uh, Angelica for emceeing. Um, I, as we close, I'd like to highlight why we are doing this symposium and what this means to us in the ADB GSP side. And I'll, I'll do that through talking through the why and the how of why we in ADB are actually doing the Japan Scholarship Program. Now, why? We do this because supporting education of both high profile and very carefully select candidates is not only the right thing to do, but we also find it to be a very effective and efficient way to change the trajectory of Asia and the Pacific. The scholars and uh, alumni will all be or are already in a very powerful position to change the world for the better. So engaging with Japan and ADB to this end, we hope will provide a great momentum to share the, uh, to achieve the shared prosperity and development in the region. So how do we do it? I think uh, this, this event here is, is a very good example of how we do it. We do this through knowledge partnership, um, as we have seen in the last two hours, but hopefully also in all the ADB GSP initiatives. So we have obviously heard and had the privilege of a very interesting debate led by the eminent speakers, 
you have of course also realized that these are all experts and global leaders sharing their knowledge with us. So this kind of knowledge sharing is crucial for us to accomplish our mission. In the partnership, the ADB GSP designated institutions are the academic pillars that provide the knowledge, the theory, and the framework brought out of serious research and academic study. So that is the foundation we build on. ADB staff and experts too are indispensable, sharing the knowledge and years of real world development experience with the scholars, alumni, as well as the universities. You will notice that we have started trying to integrate the scholars with the actual work happening in ADB, and we are very excited about that initiative. So increasingly, we are engaging our alumni to contribute to the effort, drawing from their unique experiences and perspectives, whether this is from government, private sector, civil society, as well as academia. So you might obviously ask, how can our scholars, as relatively young people, contribute very much? Well, I think the answer is very clear. They are amongst Asia's best and brightest young people. They're capable of providing innovative solutions to our most pressing challenges, some of which we've heard today. This has also been clearly demonstrated in the groundbreaking work we have seen in the thesis of the year award. I think that's a very interesting way of the scholars to prove to the world what they can do. And as you heard, some of them might have been published. So it's also very important for us as uh, finance and development professional to hear youthful perspectives on issues confronting our countries and the whole region, knowing that the scholars and the alumni will ultimately inherit the world that we are creating. So this is the kind of partnerships that we will nurture and we will strengthen so that we can build synergies, we can grow the knowledge and the skills together with our developing member clients and the region in general. So friends, you can count on ADB's continued support to achieve a more prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. So allow me to end with a quote from the uh, famous Japanese writer, Akotagawa, which is, individually, we are one drop, but together, we are the ocean. So let's together create a great wave for prosperity and resilience. Thank you very much, everybody, and I wish you a pleasant day. Thank you very much, Mr. Sorensen, for your closing remarks. We have now come to the end of our symposium. Um, hopefully we can all consider what we've learned today to contribute to the development of our respective countries and work together for the future of our region. Uh, there is an evaluation link that will be sent to all our participants. It will also be available in the chat box in a while. Uh, your feedback will be highly valuable for our upcoming events. So please let us know what you think so we can do better. Um, on the 1st of July, you also have the opportunity to meet the Japan Funds team to discuss, raise questions, and seek guidance from them on various aspects of the Japan Trust Funds. So if you'd like to know more information on the new JFPR priority areas and how they are relevant to you, or if you want to clarify how to strengthen partnerships with other universities, register for the sessions on Friday. On behalf of the ADB Japan Scholarship Program, thank you so much to our eminent speakers, fellow alumni, scholars, and organizers for your participation and the success of this event. Let us all can answer the call to work together for prosperity and resilience in Asia and the Pacific. We look forward to seeing you again in the next installment of our symposium series. So thank you very much. Take care and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angelica. Yeah, good job. Perfect. And, <laughs> and thank you very much for all participants and uh, uh, speakers, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, bye.